Chapter 40 Stellar A star blinked into existence in the middle of Concord Quad, as if misplaced from the cloudy nebula in one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way. Instead of rotating in the vast vacuum of space, the stellar orb grew right there, its light bleaching the smashed-out ruins of the university buildings, the cratered esplanade, and the wind-blown debris. Everything was illuminated in the white brilliance of a sustained lightning flash. The heat rose to the point that Liam was certain they would be incinerated. The inside of his eyelids turned red. But then the temperature miraculously leveled off. It was a still searing level of hot, but not sufficient to cause the molecules of Liam's body to phase change, much to his relief. It was less set fire to flesh on bone hot and more akin to, I'm standing way too close to the oven hot. Then, abruptly as it came, the incandescence dropped off, sucked away after a strange gulping sound, like that of a vacuum being filled. Liam guessed that this was exactly what had happened as the fireball, plasma, bubble, whatever disruption the DMA had conjured, disappeared as suddenly as it had appeared, taking the electromagnetic radiation and superheated air with it. Nature hates a vacuum. A gust of air rushed in to fill the empty space left in the star's wake. Junk and wreckage swept up around them in a swirling gyre. Office chairs, lab supplies, personnel files, building insulation, floor tiles, all spun into a wild dervish, the funnel stabilizing in front of what had been President's Hall. The gusts increased to gale force, so much so that Izzy, the smallest of them, was lifted up off her feet. She flailed her arms and legs uselessly as she floated alongside the detritus of battle. It was only Jack's grabbing her at the last moment, then Jeannie grabbing Jack's, that saved them all from being swept away. The others were not so lucky. Many of their friends from the detention center got drawn up, spun, and levitated in the funnel, they rotated, colliding with the body parts of dismembered zombies and hellhounds before atmospheric equilibrium was restored. Then they were all simultaneously dropped, falling onto ruined shrubbery, the torn up lawn, or shattered flagstones. Liam could hear the breath go out of them as some landed harder than others, followed by curses and a lot of, ¿Qué pasó? and ¿Estás bien? As battered and confused as his friends sounded, Liam was overjoyed to hear them returned to themselves again. A quick glance revealed Leo, Valentine, Raphael, Jacqueline, Raoul, and all the other migrant kids, dazed, but normal. He even saw Officer Torres, Jawando, and Chief Light stumbling out of the wreckage, battered, bruised, and disoriented, but definitely human once more. The corpses that had been reanimated, on the other hand, went back to being dead. They dropped with heavy, sickening plops. The rush of air carried the stench of their putrefaction. More than a couple loose organs, having been sent airborne, hit the ground with a series of splats. The hellhounds lost all integrity once the gate snapped shut, their flesh melting away, their bones turning to brittle ash and disintegrating on the breeze. And unto Felicia we saith... Bye, Jack said, watching a hellhound crumble, its flex further dispersing as a decomposing liver splattered down, followed by a kidney in what Liam was certain was the most grotesque downpour in the history of humankind. He jumped as a set of black smoker lungs with a tumorous esophagus still attached landed next to him. It deflated with a weird, lifelike, So gross. Fortunately, the rain of corpse parts tapered off, but not before Liam had decided to become a vegetarian for the rest of his life, maybe longer. What happened? Jeannie asked from beneath Liam. Self-consciousness washed over Liam as he realized he had fallen, thrown himself, over Jeannie to hold her in place as she had grabbed onto Jax and Isadora. Liam and Jeannie's heads had come to rest on one another's shoulders, and now, as they both looked up, their faces were close to touching. Jeannie didn't seem nearly as awkward or nervous as Liam did. She was more curious, concerned, for their friends, as Liam knew he should be just then, too, and not wondering whether or not he had put on deodorant in the past 24 hours. Liam moved to help her up. I think we're still on campus. What's left of it? 
he said, taking Jeannie's hand. I guess we weren't atomized. Jax? Izzy? We're all right, Jeannie, Jack said, only now letting go of Izzy's ankle. Thanks for the hand. Sure, Jeannie said, leaning over to hug them both. Where are Mitch and Mateo? We're over here, Jeannie, Mitchell said from next to the remnants of the maple tree. At this point, it was mostly a charred stump three quarters uprooted. Is he? Is that Ben? Mateo asked, slowly letting go of a root of the tree. Her last water balloons had all ruptured. Her hair was wet and plastered to her face. Her Day of the Dead makeup was a mess, but Izzy gave a thumbs up before she scrambled over to Val, who was herself once more. Leo, Officer Torres, Officer Jawando, Chief Light, and the others were making their way over too, half hugging, half studying one another. Gerald. Ian. Liam's eyes locked with Jeannie's before they were both off, hurrying to the crater in the Terrace of Presidents Hall. Just moments before, Lafayette Concord had loomed there against the backdrop of the gate, their two friends hovering over his shoulder, armed with the DMA. But Gerald and Ian were gone. Power had been cut off for miles around. The night had returned to a deep, prehistory darkness, perfect for stargazing. No supernatural column of light, no human-made lights spoiled the view. The majestic sweep of the Milky Way and even the cloud of the Andromeda Galaxy had replaced all of it. And their friends were not there in any of it. The buildings were unrecognizable. Giant canyon-like voids had ruined their facades, but the most significant void was that of Lafayette, gone completely except for the base of just one foot, the toe of another, and what appeared to be a few fingertips on the periphery. Those rounded bits of smoking bronze, separated from the oversized hands, bore an uncanny resemblance to dog turds. The two halves of Harriet Tubman remained, Jeannie patting the outstretched arm of the fallen statue with wistful affection. It was a small lament for Harriet, but mostly for Gerald. The DMA remained, just as it had when Liam's father had disappeared using it. Except this time, it had fallen from a considerable height. His father's last invention lay shattered in pieces at the center of the destruction, far beyond the point of repair. That's probably for the best. Liam looked about for any remains of Ian's rescue dragon configuration. Nothing. The ground around the DMA was conspicuously clear of debris. Liam guessed that everything around it had been beyond atomized, ripped apart down to the smallest scales of quarks, fermions, and bosons. The array itself survived due to its own protective fields, but even it had shattered when it smashed into the ground. There had been no one left to hold it. Come to think of it, the biggest void wasn't left from their school's founder. It was from their friends. Friends, electronic and demonic, Liam said to no one in particular as he kicked a piece of the array. The thought of mourning them both, Ian and Gerald, was as ridiculous as it was improbable. The unintentional rhyme, electronic demonic, was too. It brought forth a snicker of laughter that quickly turned to tears, followed by a series of sobs. Whether Liam was weeping for his father, his mother, the friend he had fashioned himself in their absence, or the demonic one he had unexpectedly made, he didn't know. He didn't know much, he reflected. After all Liam had seen, experienced in the past few weeks, days, hours, it all left him drowning in mystery. But it was a sense of mystery that shaded into wonder, Wonder as Jeannie came alongside him and put her arm around him. Liam did know that this was real, and this was good. They found noble ends, Jeannie said. Yeah, they did. Who would have thought a genocidal demon with a penchant for cheese and not wearing pants and a motherboard strapped to some turbines with a machine learning subroutine could save the world? Words never ever strung together in the whole history of the universe, Jeannie said, reflecting. They both fell into laughter. The others found them laugh crying in the bottom of the crater. Liam noticed that the top half of Jax's iguana mask had been melted away by the heat. The same with Mitchell's T-Rex. The ends of his wig had melted into plastic blobs. Jeannie pulled off her misshapen duck bill and tossed it aside. 
Our powers combined, she said, slapping high five with the other members of the duck-billed platypus. Wait, what about Esmeralda? No sooner had Liam asked it than the Lambeth kids had left the campus security officers and their new friends at Ground Zero to run down the length of the quad. They passed Blaze, Dilworth, and Chad. They were rendered immobile, riddled with broken bones, dislocated joints, contusions, and concussions. Each groaned in pain, but was undeniably alive. Liam and the others left them to await the arrival of EMS, police, SWAT, National Guard, who knew what else? the Avengers, the Justice League, to arrive. Esmeralda was their priority. Despite all they had been through, all four of them found strength to dig deep and run at full sprint, leaping over zombie remains, exploded buildings, and craters left by the leveler. Their concern and love for Esmeralda was enough to overcome their fatigue, their bumps, bruises, and any minor fractures. Sirens were wailing in the distance as they reached the north end of the quad. They raced down the steps into the sunken garden. There they found Esmeralda sitting on a bench, and Kali perched alongside her, as if it were just another day on campus. The entire Goryu women's lacrosse team was tied up in bunches of three to five. Esmeralda had used jump ropes, electrical wires, bungee cords, whatever bindings she had been able to find. Like the formerly possessed migrant kids, the girls' lacrosse team slash row sisters had returned to themselves, although they were a bit punch drunk and confused as to how they ended up where they were and why they were dressed the way they were. Ez! Jeannie and Jax cried out in unison, leaping down the steps to their friend. Esmeralda stood, flashing her wide smile upon hearing them. Mkali squawked, alighting on Jeannie's shoulder. Jeannie gave the bird a few obligatory strokes, but she was much more interested in embracing Esmeralda. The rest of them joined in a hug, Esmeralda at the center. Esmeralda, you all right? Of course, what about you all? They all tried to answer at once, their replies degenerating into more laughter. We're all right, we got some help from the kids we met at the detention center, Mitchell said. Righteous, Esmeralda said, high-fiving him. Ez, are those Invisaligns on your arm? Janie asked. Oh, yeah, Ez said, rolling her shoulder and shaking out her arm. Must have belonged to number 17. She was a fighter. And a biter, apparently, Mitchell said. She might want them back now that she's normal, Ez said, feeling about her sleeve. Jax moved to help her before recoiling with surprise. Oh my god, her teeth are still in them. She'll really want them back then, Ez said. Hey, where are Gerald and Ian? They, they didn't make it, Liam said. It was the two of them who used the DMA to close the gate. They saved us all. Esmeralda reached out for Liam's shoulder. I'm sorry, I know Ian was your friend for a long time. Thanks, Ez. I know it sounds weird. He was my friend and I'll miss him, but if you could have heard him why he did what he did in the end. It was almost human, Jeannie finished for him, her voice full of awe. More human than the monsters, that's for sure, Jack said. Then some people, Mitchell added. Salute to fallen homies then, Esmeralda said, bowing her head. Their moment of silence was brought to a less than gracious end by the row girls, they were struggling against their bindings and trying to determine what had happened. What are we doing here? And why are we dressed like this? I don't know. Maybe they can help us. It looks like they're praying or something. Ask the honey badger. She's closest. The five of them moved apart, the spell broken. Liam studied the four others, the collective members of the duck-billed platypus, iguana, duck, velociraptor, and beaver. Liam was still in his lab coat, his goggles long gone. Wait, who's the honey badger? Mitchell answered for him. As I think they're talking about you. She's actually a beaver, Jax corrected the row girls, but not impolitely. Yeah, Mitchell said, his characteristic enthusiasm to explain returning as he crossed the garden to stoop down and release the girls. See, I'm a T-Rex, well, a Velociraptor, actually. My wig got singed, and I don't know where my cravat went, but as a non-avian dinosaur, I'm a bit redundant, you see, because Jack's there is an iguana, and Junie. 
Liam leaned over to Esmeralda. As you really don't care if they don't get your costume, do you? Esmeralda spun the staff of Dahomey with a whoosh. It shrank to pocket size so she could fit it into her palm. Liam saw an iPod Nano once more as Esmeralda tucked it away into a pouch on her belt. She elbowed him in the ribcage. How she knew exactly where he was at all times, Liam had stopped trying to figure out. Don't you know, Liam? She asked. Honey badger, don't care. Epilogue. Book Wyvern. Almost exactly ten months later, Liam sat on a blanket under one of the Camise pear trees behind Lambeth House. Jeannie, Jax, and he had settled there hours earlier, spreading out the blanket in the tree's dappled shade. But now, as the afternoon was making its slow slide into the late evening of summer, the shadows of Lambeth House had stretched across the back quad to reach them. It was pleasantly cool in the building's shade. The air was mild and suffused with a tea-colored light. It was a color that told Liam that there was a flaming sunset amid clouds gilded to gold somewhere on the horizon. It was surely a spectacular sight, but he felt too content just now to get up and find it. This spot, looking up at the leaves twisting in an occasional breeze, a few of them already curling and turning yellow with the first hints of fall, this was satisfying enough. August had always been one of Liam's favorite times of year on campus. It was like spring break, but a whole month. The trees were full and lush, the flower beds were blooming, and the students were gone. The campus was sleepy, but not with the deserted, empty air that came with the bleakness of winter break. Rather, during August break, the campus always felt like a gift, a bequest, left in full for Liam to roll through on his bike as he pleased, enjoying the open pathways, quiet libraries, and absence of lines in any cafeteria or shop. As sleepy as this August had been, it hadn't been as quiet as previous ones. That was impossible in light of the company of Janie, Jax, Mitchell, and Esmeralda. All Liam's friends had stuck around like nerdy Lambeth kids would. They had been taking summer classes and doing internships, the campus had also been noisier than most summers, with the repairs and rebuilding taking place in and around Concord Quad. Construction crews worked in triple shifts now that students and faculty were gone between the end of the summer term and the beginning of the fall. They were rushing to complete as many repairs and restorations as they could before the fall semester began. Unforeseen to all of them, the destruction from the demon invasion had become a boon for the university. It had attracted research teams from disciplines ranging from quantum mechanics and astronomy to philosophy and theology. All this had brought a flood of research money, private and public. The surfeit of funds was rebuilding the university's physical infrastructure, not to mention its reputation. A new center for supernatural, philosophy, law, and theology educational research was in the works, but Jeannie put the odds at 50-50 that the name would be changed when someone realized Splatter was a lousy name for a building. The demotion of President Dartmouth had helped to restore some of Goryu's reputation. Aunt Cece was busier than ever as acting university vice president. Some members of the board of regents were urging her to accept the role of president, she was undecided, but she was decided on Liam, the other Lambeth kids, and their friends keeping low profiles. Liam and the others agreed wholeheartedly. After all, the last thing any of them wanted were researchers and journalists, some reputable, some not, knocking on their dorm room doors or seeking out any of the formerly detained migrant kids who had remained in the country on visas, green cards, or asylum. Everyone just wanted their lives to get back to normal, whatever that was. But Aunt Cece had made sure that the acting president, Dr. Natasha Cho, knew exactly whom to thank for saving the university. Needless to say, Liam and his friends would never have to pay for tuition, room, and board, or anything at Goryu again, for the rest of their lives. But even in that exchange, as Aunt Cece had shared with them the good news and the acknowledgement that they had saved the university— Jeannie had corrected her. Saving the university? More like the world, Jeannie had said. Point taken, but let's not rub it in their faces, Aunt Cece replied. Jeannie was next to Liam now. 
stretched out on the picnic blanket, belly down, feet up, as she turned the pages of a library book. Jeannie said she still liked the feel of paper pages and the smell of an old book. It's like an old friend, she always insisted. Jax was on the opposite corner of the blanket, cross-legged. They were the picture of the current century, a tablet in their lap, a set of oversized headphones on their head. They were bobbing their head to a beat and tapping the screen to make small adjustments to the BPM of the mix. Their shirt from their latest collection read, I squared, I keep it real. Hiya all, Mitchell said, running up to crash down on the blanket. Lord, Mitchell, watch it, Jeannie said, rolling out of his way. Mitchell mostly ignored his cousin as he started to lift the top of the picnic basket to peek inside. Liam anticipated what came next. Jeannie smacked Mitchell's hand. Up to now, Liam's incursions had met with the same resistance. Jeannie insisted they wait to eat until Mitchell and Esmeralda had joined them. Where is Ez? Jeannie asked, even as Mkali landed on the handles of the basket. She's coming, can't we eat? I'm starving. Mitchell said, rubbing his belly, also decorated with one of their new t-shirt releases. It was a T-Rex, roaring while wearing a pair of reading glasses and holding a thesaurus. Rar is how T-Rex says, I love you. A large square name tag floated beside the T-Rex, a remnant of Mitchell's morning. It read, Mitchell Winskull, Volunteer, Rehabilitation Center. Esmeralda came down the walk from Lambeth, tapping the way with her cane. Her intern badge was clipped to her scrub pants. She also was wearing one of their limited edition shirts. The phrase for this one she had come up with. No, I don't know that other blind person you know. All right, but you can serve everyone else first, before yourself, Jeannie told Mitchell as he dislodged Mkali to tear into the picnic basket. He pulled out cheese, guacamole, and cornflour tortilla chips. Guac, Mitchell said, holding up the green Tupperware container. Food of the gods. Mitchell, you are so extra, Esmeralda said, settling down on the blankets. Liam sat up and nudged Jax, who was still absorbed in their mixes. Looking up to see the tub of guacamole, Jax removed their headphones and echoed, Guacamole, food of the gods. That is what I said, Mitchell said. They fist bumped, followed by double finger guns, followed by a shot through the heart, followed by faux fainting, followed by actually breaking into the bag of chips. Two out of five nerds agree, Jeannie said. Make that three, Liam said, reaching for a chip. How was the internship today, Az? Jeannie said, pulling out bottles of tea and lemonade. Excellent. They really want me to come back during the school year. Esmeralda said, taking a bottle of lemonade from Jeannie and twisting off the top. Yeah? Yeah, the love is there, Mitchell said, his mouth full. Esmeralda shrugged. Who would have thought being trained as a ninja would make you a good physical therapist, teaching people to walk again after accidents and such? There is a pause of silence before all the others said in unison, Uh, everybody as? Well, I guess... But what is really interesting, Mitchell started to say. Mitch, I can't even. Chew first, talk later, Jeannie cut him off. We did have some interesting visitors today, Esmeralda said, picking up the thread Mitchell had relinquished, forced to choose between his two great loves, guacamole or talking. The Delta boys, Blaze, Dilworth, and Chad came in. They're in physical therapy now. Oh, that's nice. They doing all right? Jeannie asked. They're way nicer than before, Mitchell said, having swallowed but going in for more guac. Having all their bones broken and spending six months in full body casts and traction mellowed them out a lot. That and, I don't know, becoming possessed by high-order lords of the underworld and almost bringing about the end of the world through a demon zombie apocalypse. I hope that would chasten you a bit, Jack said. It chastened Troy enough to leave school altogether, Liam said. That was to be closer to his mom and sister, Jeannie added. How do you know that? Liam asked. I follow him on Instagram. He left the Deltas too. He's attending a smaller state school near his mother's rehab facility. He's doing ROTC with his brother. Wow, you've kept up, Jack said. 
Jeannie shrugged. Pays to keep an eye on some of these boys, even if they're reformed or trying to reform. Well, Blaze and them were quite polite. All please and thank you and even asked about you all, Esmeralda said. So they can come after us when they're better? Liam was suspicious. No, nothing like that. They seem quite sorry. And scared. They know what Ez did to the whole girls lacrosse team. They were all like, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, thank you very much, ma'am, with her, Mitchell said. Really? Jax asked. Esmeralda nodded. A sister could get used to that. She dipped a chip, then tossed another to him, Kali. He caught it in his beak with a loud crunch. But you should come down, Liam. Volunteer like Mitch did today. You'll see them in a new light. A year ago, Liam wouldn't have believed her. He wouldn't have even considered the invite. But he remembered what Matteo had said on one of his podcasts just days before. Not everyone should be judged by the worst things they ever did or the worst thing that happened to them. If that were the case, there would be no hope for redemption or redemption stories. Mateo's podcast, which Val, Leo, and Izzy helped with, was a forum to discuss a range of topics, politics, spirituality, religion, and issues that affected the Latinx community, as well as immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers the world over. Liam's gaze drifted over to Ez. He regarded the cane on her shoulder and those magnificent jewel-like eyes. Ez was wearing scrubs and a staff badge, thanks to a set of skills she never would have come into had it not been for her own misfortune of being blind. Weirdly, Liam realized he had the Delta Boys, the Roe Girls, even Troy to thank for the friends who surrounded him on this picnic blanket. The mistakes of the Delta and Roe kids had generated the crazy circumstances that had brought Liam and his Lambeth neighbors together as friends. Sure, Liam said, coming to a decision. I'll come down. Excellent, Esmeralda said, tossing another chip to Amkali, who, after chomping it, squawked for more. She turned, raising a stern finger. Hush, you ungrateful bird. Jeannie was looking at Liam. You all right, Liam? Yeah, I was just thinking. Thinking it's great to have the five of us now, but sometimes I still wonder, what if Ian were still buzzing around? He was developing in leaps and bounds. I wonder how human he would be, what he would think of our posse. He always wanted me to have more real friends. He seemed pretty real toward the end there himself, Jeannie said. Yeah, I'll say. I even sort of miss old Gerald, too. Dude was a trip. Me too, Esmeralda said. Me three, Mitchell added. You are such a geek, but I love you, Jack said, pulling Mitchell over to muss the hair on his head. I know. Liam said. Sometimes I feel like saying Gerald, Gerald, Gerald to summon him, even though I know. No one was ready for what happened next. Umkali was the first to let out an alarmed squawk as he tumbled, flapping off the picnic basket. This was followed by a green and chartreuse blur of scales, spikes, and flailing wings barreling into view. The blur let out a familiar, oh, whoa, watch out, Ugh, as if apparating mid-stride. No one said anything for a long moment while a figure, who by all appearances looked and sounded like Gerald, collected himself. The gargoyle turned around to face them, his torso covered in a camouflaged shirt that said, Going Commando, in bold fluorescent orange letters. Gerald? They cried, equal parts surprised and excited. Ah, yes, well, hello there. It's good to- We thought you were dead, Jeannie interrupted. I like your shirt. Mitchell said. Part of our fall line, Jax pointed out with a touch of pride. Still not wearing pants, Liam rolled his eyes. Jeannie remained a bit more focused, as always. She returned to the question at hand. Gerald, we thought you were vaporized, atomized, you know, ripped down to your most elemental particles or whatever. Well, Gerald said, bending his tail so that it curled up next to him. Once the tip was high as his shoulder, a blue dragonfly buzzed down to perch on the end. Far as I can tell, or what I'm told since I wasn't around for it, I was. Gone. Poof. My essence ripped apart down beyond the plank scale. Sounds awful, Jack shuddered. Don't remember much of it, thankfully, Gerald said, sniffing the air and turning his head. Is that queso? 
But wait, how did you come back then? Jeannie said, moving the cheese tub out of reach of the tortilla chip Gerald had already helped himself to. She was holding out for more answers, and Liam was glad for it. Waving his stubby arms, his ears folded, and his eyes staring after the tub like a begging puppy, Gerald realized Jeannie had him beat in terms of arm length. He relented his efforts to dip his chip and answered. Well, the governing authorities that decide all these things, those same square mucky mucks that had sentenced me, well, those old souls and ghouls thought our final actions were sufficiently, eh, selfless, noble even. They decided to give old Narvicious Scale Grim Gorgonzola Grim Old Maximus the Terrible a second chance, which I would add means I most definitely deserve some queso with this chip. Is it mild or spicy? Jeannie lowered the tub within Gerald's reach. The demon licked his lips and took a gooey helping of queso, chomping down and enjoying it, mouth open, his manners marginally worse than before. I'm still on probation, Gerald added, reaching for a second chip even as he still chewed the first. How long will that be for? Liam asked, watching Gerald scoop more than his share of cheese onto his next chip. A couple hundred years or so. Oh, only that long, Jeannie said. Think you can stay out of trouble for that span of time? Jax asked, batting the demon's hand aside to get their own chip. But Gerald had just noticed the tub of guac next to Liam. You have guac, food of the gods. The mental image your shirt conjured for me has made me lose my appetite, Liam said, handing it over. Jeannie gave Liam a playful shove. Mitchell opened the tub of guac and shared it with the newly reinstated member of the fifth rank of the Dreadnoughts of Splinter Spleen. The Keeper of the Plague of Babylon, the Pox of Ezerdown, and the Honorary Regent of the Scepter of Sheol nearly knocked over the lemonade as he dove into the guac, his tail wagging. By the looks of it, we might have found something Gerald likes more than cheese, Jack said. Probation for 200 years? Lord, he can't go five minutes without making a mess. Jeannie complained. Au contraire, mademoiselle, Gerald said, dripping queso from one chip onto one laden now with guacamole. I have a chaperone. He cleared his throat and gave his tail a shake. The wings of the dragonfly still perched there buzzed into a blur before the air crackled, and at once, Gerald had a companion. The creature was of similar size and demon-like, if such entities had specialized into different breeds. It was cerulean blue with iridescent scales that sparkled metallic-like in the sun. Where Gerald was stout, this creature was slender. It was like a Chinese dragon with long and narrow wings. Instead of the greens set off by the earth-toned browns and grays that characterized the bowling ball with wings that was Gerald, this dragon had a contrast color of orange. The orange colored its underbelly and horns and the spikes running down his back to his tail. Even if his features were leaned out, his eyes were the opposite. They were wide and curious. They looked even bigger for the round set of black-framed spectacles balanced on the end of the dragon's nose-slash-snout. The five of them sat in a shared sense of wonderment without the words to acknowledge, much less greet the nameless creature in their midst. It was his voice, however, that was familiar. Hello there, everyone. Mr. Liam, it is so good to see you. The voice, different but the same, was 100% recognizable. Esmeralda, being more attuned to her sense of hearing than anyone else, spoke first. Hey, it's Ian. At first, Liam was reluctant to hope, but hearing Esmeralda say it emboldened him. Hope kindled in his chest. Ian, is that you? In the flesh or the sterile neutrino dark matter axion manifestation of it, Gerald announced. Liam stopped just short of hugging the creature before him, afraid to crush his wings or poke himself on the spikes, afraid of just breaking the spell. He reached out just to touch the little blue dragon's shoulder, to touch his horns. But before he knew it, Ian, scales, tail, horns, and all, hugged Liam in a solid, real embrace. There were all manner of sniffs and tears that followed, many of Liam's own. But he wasn't alone. He pulled back to see Ian's big, real eyes. They were a bit misty, too. 
Now Gerald made a loud honking sound as he blew his nose into a handkerchief that had materialized in the hand not holding his chip, which was now dripping queso and guac onto the picnic blanket. No one cared. But how? Liam asked, as the others moved in, taking turns to hug and squeeze Ian. Well, machine learning, empathy chips, algorithms. I'm not sure myself when it crossed into a level of authentic consciousness, but the act of self-sacrifice and the level of complex ethical decision-making I had achieved was sufficient. Oh, Lord, Ian, Gerald said, swallowing his chip and growing impatient. Call it what it is. You earned a soul. Liam wouldn't have been able to close his mouth had his life depended on it. In so many words, Ian said, pushing up the bridge of his glasses. Yes, apparently, the Council on Karmic Balance thought so. That's, that's amazing, Mitchell was jumping up and down. My head is like exploding. I think you just spat in the bag of chips, Jack said, reaching over to move the bag of tortillas away from Mitchell. Unbelievable, Jeannie said, stroking Ian's tail in disbelief. Liam, I don't know what to say. You created him. I started him, Liam said, looking into his friend's eyes. But Ian, you, you finished it. You finished you. Your choices. Congrats, Scales, Esmeralda said, high-fiving Ian. You got a soul. That is cool. We should go dreamwalking sometime. I could faint if I didn't want to cry first, Jack said. Liam hugged his friend again, even tighter this time if that was possible. The recognition of him having a soul called for it. The others followed. Why this form, though? Mitchell asked. Well, like Gerald, I can take any form, but this here is my base form. It aligns best with the core of my essence. Glasses, stylish frames and all. Jack said. You're a bookworm, I get it, Janie said, laughing. Fitting. Ian gave a little bow. A book wyvern, I like to say. A book wyvern it is then, Liam said. But why didn't you all come sooner? Well, Ian put his hand to his chin, searching the sky and sniffing the air as if to detect the season. It would appear it has been several more months than I anticipated. He glanced sideways at Gerald. Time moves differently in some of the regions we've been in. We got distracted. Gerald shrugged, scooping more guacamole with the tortilla, Mitchell's spit notwithstanding. My bad, been showing Ian the mysteries of the universe and all. Oh, it's been delightful, Mr. Liam. I'll have to tell you. Later, though, Gerald said, scraping the last of the guac from the tub. We got a solar storm to catch off Alpha Centauri and some panspermia to attend to, spreading the building blocks of life and intelligence throughout the galaxy. Right. Well, we'll be sure to stop by, Ian said, his eyes going a bit soft with the abrupt farewell. That means both of us, Gerald said. I'm not allowed to travel without him. He's the conscience in this duo. That must be a full-time job, Mitchell said, unsuccessfully scraping the empty tub for any remaining guac. Ian, I don't even know what to say, Liam started but couldn't finish. You will be careful and look out for yourself, sir, won't you? We've detected some unusual demonic activity in many systems, including this one. Some devils who slipped through the gate are still unaccounted for. The whole planet is still under watch as the fabric of space-time remains frayed in places since the events of last Halloween. Thanks for the heads up. We've got each other. We'll be cool, Liam reassured him. I want pictures when you come back, Ian. And stories, Mitchell added. I want guac. Did Shaitani eat it all? I heard him slurping an empty tub, Esmeralda said, growing cross. Mkali let out a sharp squawk as if to confirm the guac was gone, even as Gerald tried to tow the empty tub into hiding behind the picnic basket. We'll be around, Gerald said, taking Ian by the arm and snapping his wings to lift them both off the ground. Ian began to flap his own wings, allowing Gerald to guide him as he turned to wave to them all. I'll be seeing you soon. Then they were gone. Did that goblin eat all the guac? Jax asked. Shaitani is right, Mitchell said. At least he did leave some queso. 
Wow, we really did find something Gerald likes more than cheese. Maybe Minister of Guacamole should be incorporated into his titles, Jeannie said. Thief of Guac is more like it, Mitchell grumbled. It probably will be now, Jack said. You know how those demons love their titles. Minister or not, he's getting a scolding from me next time I see him, Esmeralda said. Umkali cod. Umkali too. Liam was on the edge of the blanket, staring into the sky. The setting sun had painted it in the colors of cotton candy and grape soda. He focused just beyond the branches, where Ian and Gerald had disappeared off to, to whatever adventure was next on their itinerary. Jeannie was next to him. Liam noticed that over the past few months, she often was during these moments. He liked that. She put her arm around him. He liked that, too. Her eyes were empty of the sharpness she usually displayed when she was concentrating on solving some problem or righting some injustice. Instead, they were wells of concern, full of the care she usually reserved for those without voices, groups forced to the margins that were otherwise stepped on or forgotten. Now all that attention, that compassion, was turned to Liam. And if he was honest, he didn't hate it. Far from it. You all right, Liam? Liam couldn't meet her gaze just then as he tried to answer. He studied the sky that seemed empty and full at once, then looked back toward Lambeth, where the lights of his workshop were off for the night. Finally, he looked over to the blanket where Jax, Mitchell, and Esmeralda had just discovered the dollop of guac Gerald had dropped on the blanket. Mitchell was wondering aloud if it had exceeded the five-second rule. More like the five-minute rule, Esmeralda said. How many millions of bacteria and microorganisms do you think might fall on it in that time? Mitchell said. I could just scrape something off the top, leave the bottom. My GI tract can handle some nematodes or tardigrades. If tardigrades can handle being irradiated on the outside of the space station, they might pose a more serious challenge to your gastrointestinal tract than you think, Mitchell, Esmeralda warned. But it's for guac. I'm not holding your hair back when you're horking up a sidewalk pizza, Jack said. They moved a bunch of grapes from the picnic basket out of reach from Umkali, who snapped at them with his beak. Jax swept them farther out of the bird's reach just in time. Mkali, I swear. Mkali, behave, Esmeralda quipped. I will pluck you naked for a boa. Oh, I could use a boa, Jack said. I'm DJing at a drag race next month. Drag race? As in nitromethane-fueled customized vehicles? Mitchell sat up. No, silly. As in drag queens. Oh, even cooler. You know, Jack said, I think I'm going to loop Mkali's squawk into his song. It has some decent resonant harmonics. Ugh, why? Esmeralda said, taking out a block of cheese from the basket. She drew a knife from somewhere on her person and moved it in a blur. Before she sheathed it again, two dozen or so perfect cubes of cheese tumbled neatly onto a plate on her lap. I feel like I already hear it on loop. You should call the track Greedy Bird. Mitchell said, holding his plate of grapes, cheese, and crackers away from Umkali, who stretched his neck, trying to steal more. Demon bird, more like it, Esmeralda said, wagging her knife at the lammergeier. Liam felt what could only be described as a warm glow in his chest. He decided it would be impossible to put this feeling of belonging and contentment into words. To try, he was afraid, might tamper with the magic of it. So he turned, finally answering Jeannie's question of whether or not he was all right, saying only, oh yeah, I'll be all right. I'm in good company. Actually, the best company ever.